Um, okay, so thank you very much, and I'll move very swiftly along. So yeah, look, just to really speak about an overview briefly of um, the threats of invasive species and the responses really we need to take to them in Ireland and looking at examples from the aquatic, yeah, so the freshwater and riparian environment. Has the screen moved on for you there? Yes, yes perfect. Yeah. perfect, great, wonderful. Okay, so just to start with what are invasives? And this is very important when we consider kind of why we need to take action um, against them to mitigate the threat of their presence of introduction and when they are here. And what they are is they're non-native to Ireland, so they don't naturally belong here and they wouldn't naturally be able to get here by themselves. And they're only here because of human intervention, whether that be intentional or unintentional intervention. Once here, they not only survive, but they thrive and they spread. And in doing so, they cause negative impact. And it's just also kind of to remember and understand with invasive species in their new environments, um, they're often free of the constraints that kept them in check in their native range. They're perhaps free from uh, environmental constraints such as uh, extremes of climate or biological constraints. You know, perhaps they don't have predators or pathogens here that would keep their populations in check. And they're also under here, they're at an advantage because they're free of those constraints and in a new area. And they're also at an advantage because perhaps they have other traits that will help them here because they haven't evolved with the native species. So things like they germinate first or they spawn first. So really when they get here, they're at a, a leg up, I suppose, in comparison to our natives to be in a good position to compete with them. We think of some of their impacts so one of them is on their interactions with other species. For instance, through predation. Uh, this is an image of an American mink predating on a gannet chick in Scotland. And like we know in Ireland, they, they predate on birds, bird eggs, small mammals, uh, fish, a lot of aquatic invertebrates, and, and really are causing a big impact from predation. Other examples would be that they're an introduction of parasites and pathogens. So the one on the bottom here left is the introduction of the eel swim bladder nematode, which feeds on the blood supply to the swim bladder of the eels um, and increases their mortality and impedes their success for spawning. And also introduction of, for instance, the crayfish plague, um, which infects and kills the protected white clawed crayfish. They can be uh, compete with native species for space and resources. And particularly, we think a lot of this with riparian plants, but also in the aquatic environment. Uh, this is actually a, an example of the large uh, species you see there is a native swan or duck mussel and settled on it at various sizes are zebra mussels. And what they're doing there is like they settle on anything hard. It wouldn't a mussel, a stone, a, a water intake pipe, whatever it might be. What they do is Sorry they to clap. interrupt you, Colette, yes. uh, but a few people have mentioned that the volume is quite low. Are you able to increase the volume at your end, please? Yes. Is that any better? Yeah, that is. Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, uh, so again, like what they can do is they can really just smother our native, uh, some of our native bivalve species. And this has caused significant decrease of them in some areas, particularly in alkaline lakes, um, and, and they're even being lost from some areas. They can also change habitats here. Uh, zebra mussels can increase light availability, causing a, a mass growth of macrophyte plants. And some species like uh, here is this uh, Lagrosiphon major. So it would have been sold as an oxygenating plant. And this actually reduces light availability. It grows right from the bottom of the lake bed through the water column up to the surface. And these are images taken from Loch Corrib, where you would have had a lovely diversity of macrophytes and caraphytes there at the, the lake bed and through the column. And now it's just a monoculture of Lagrosiphon major. They can also change the substrate. These are images of Asian clam, first recorded in Ireland in 2011. Um, and in a number of river systems now, unfortunately, they have been found in a range of densities from 1,000 to 17,000 individuals per meter square. Quite phenomenal, really, um, and particularly in such a short time. And what they can do is, say, if, it's in a, if they settle in a nice gravel riverbed area, that's ideal for spawning for salmon or trout. They can change that to kind of more of a silty bed that isn't suitable for that spawning and so can really affect the whole ecology of that system. 
they can also impact on the functioning of ecosystems and the services we get from them in a, in a variety of ways. Destabilizing riverbanks, exasperating flooding, changing soil fertility and nutrient cycling and affecting water quality. Uh, this is just an example of Himalayan balsam uh, growing along a river bank on the bottom left. And like many of the invasive riparian plants, it grows up quickly and densely in the summertime. Come winter, in the other image there, they die back. And all you're left with the Himalayan balsam is kind of like a straw, like dead mass. Um, and the native plants are gone and all the protection they afforded to the river bank and what they gave then to the nutrient cycling uh, to the species that live there is all gone. And also just direct human impact in many ways. Um, for instance, site access. So the first picture in the bottom left there is of Japanese knotweed. And this just shows it's, it's typical nature along a river of growing densely. And you're, you're not going to be able to access the site there, whether it be for work or, or for leisure. The middle picture for floating pennywort an aquatic plant, this is on a slow moving water body or a canal. And again, it'll just affect your navigation through there. And all of these are supposed to affect our, our recreational enjoyment and cultural activities of an area. And then on health, so I suppose most notoriously would be the giant hogweed. Uh, if your skin comes in contact with the sap of the plant and there's the presence of sunlight, you can get anything from a mild irritation to severe burning uh, requiring skin grafts. So it's a significant issue, particularly in, in public areas um, and anywhere you could have people going along a riverbank. And of course, cost, all of this costs in many different ways. Uh, in Europe, there was an estimate and the Commission reckon it's an underestimate that cost is 12 billion per year on control and damage due to invasive alien species. And in, Arley, in Ireland, Kelly et al. in 2013 reported just under 203 million is the estimate annual cost to Ireland. So I suppose when we know the impacts of them, I, we really need to try and mitigate against them. So we kind of have to have an understanding, well, look, how did they get here? What actions do we need to take? As we said, they're here because of human intervention. And again, from a report in 2013, we know that the main ways of the invasive species we do have in Ireland, that they arrived here have historically been through uh, trade for ornamental and horticulture. In the pet and aquaria trade, they've been brought in for hunting and fishing. You know, they've become attached to vessels and they've been brought in for live food and just contaminants of products and goods. And once here then, how are they spreading? Well, it's just natural to spread, spread seeds, you know, are, are blown away. Uh, species can travel through our, our corridors, our aquatic corridors. There's escapes and human aided dispersal, such as dumping perhaps of aquatic weeds into water bodies, hitchhiking again, perhaps species stuck on the hulls of boats on angling equipment and release. There have uh, what certainly seem like intentional releases in Ireland as well of invasive species. When we kind of think, well, what is the trend of what's been happening? Um, just some study back again in 2014, we saw that there have been four times as many invasive species recorded in Ireland in the 20th century as there was in the previous one. This is a trend that's seen globally, and it's largely due to globalization. I suppose we have more movement of people and goods around the world now. And with that brings this intentional and unintentional introduction. About one fifth of the invasive species in Ireland were recorded in the freshwater environment. And the greatest increase in trend of introduction has actually been for the freshwater environment since about 1980. And what we've also found is that most of the freshwater non-native species are actually more likely to become high impact invaders. Uh, it's, it's kind of unclear why, but there's a lot of assumptions we could kind of make around it, but it certainly is very concerning. Here is just an image of some of the species that have been first recorded or re-recorded in Ireland in the last 20 years related to the aquatic, um, semi-aquatic environments. Some of these are established and widespread and some are just kind of individual or one-off occurrences. And here are some of the species that are predicted to arrive into the future and that you would have concern about them becoming invasive in Ireland. And again, this was from a 2012 study. 
back in 2017, Diva said um, there was an extensive workshop and desktop work undertaken with a lot of experts with an objective to identify the top species likely to arrive, establish an impact on biodiversity in Ireland between 2017 and, and 2027 in a 10 year period. And just to show here, out of the top 10 of those likely to arrive um, and impact, six of them are freshwater species. So again, it really does raise the concern of the threat, the ongoing threat, the future threat, and that we do need to take action. So what can be done? Oh, apologies, that hasn't come up right. Well, basically there's a hierarchical approach that we need to take when dealing with um, actions to mitigate against the threat of invasive species. We need to prevent them arriving here to begin with. If they've been identified as a potential invader, let's try and take action to um, prevent their intentional introduction. If they're a traded species, you look at ban on trade. If they could get here unintentionally, what are the pathways and to take action against that? And currently in Ireland, the data centre um, with, on behalf of the National Parks and Wildlife Service are working with a variety of stakeholders on developing pathway action plans for the recreational angling and boating sectors. And that's to prevent introduction into Ireland and spread from one site to another within Ireland. At borders, we need uh, pr you know, proper protections and inspections in place and post-border to have a range of uh, elements in place as well. We need to detect for them as soon as they arrive. And this is very important because particularly in the aquatic environment, the longer they're there, the greater risk of them establishing and spreading and being beyond the possibility of control. So detecting them, knowing what to look out for, or even just reporting anything that seems unfamiliar. You can report sightings to the National Biodiversity Data Centre uh, in and for fisheries are under a variety of bodies and the idea is then is that look you would quickly work to identify that to verify it to go on site and inspect and take rapid response to try and eradicate it before it establishes or before it spreads failing to do that failing to prevent them getting here failing to eradicate them you really are just looking at containment and long-term control measures and that's only where it's feasible or, or possible uh, it'll be very difficult in an aquatic environment and there are very few cases of successful eradication. It's, a, uh, it's an unwieldy environment to try and deal with and any measures you do take, I suppose, to try and remove that invasive species are likely to impact on your non-target species too. So it has to be careful consideration given to the impacts of it and is it actually going to work or not. And just then, I suppose to say, you know, there are a range of measures and actions you can take when you do go to control them. This is just one site that was up in Dublin where um, there was Japanese knotweed growing along a river. A lot of great work was done on surveying and awareness and a uh, company brought in then to try and deal with it. And I suppose this was a number of years ago and the measures yours weren't appropriate. There was a lot of just basically cutting it down, chipping it um, on an open chipper on a towpath above with much of the vegetation also flowing downstream. Uh, this would just really aid its spread and it's unlikely to really impact it on the control of the plant. So it's getting proper advice on how best to deal with the invasive species when you do go to tackle them. One minute, Colette. Wonderful, thank you, Anne. Um, and also this is just a picture, it won't be very clear, but in these circles are bunches of giant hogweed. This was a site I used to go to collect specimens of giant hogweed for an identification roadshow every year. I hadn't visited the site in two years. And when I came back, I, I was sick to my stomach. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of giant hogweed. This is on a river bride on the Waterford Cork border near where I live. Um, and I suppose the point I'm making here is I knew they were there. I had spoken to some people in the local fishing club. I didn't make great attempts to find out who the landowner was, but often in aquatic, you know, in riparian right areas, there's a number of stakeholders here who might need to have an interest in wanting to remove these species or not have them spread further. So efforts do need to be made to, to discuss and see all those agencies, all those landowners, whoever it might be involved and, and to take coordinated action and to look at taking action in a catchment basis. And just to finish, I suppose, no matter what we do, whether we work and play in or near the aquatic environment, you know, let's try and think of our, our own activities that could cause a risk of introduction and spread. 
and take measures then. These are the biosecurity measures to prevent those introductions and spread. So checking your equipment, your vessels, whatever it is, cleaning them, drying them thoroughly for at least 48 hours and disinfecting them where thorough drying is impossible. And so to finish, um, you know, sometimes it can take hundreds of years before we see changes and, you know, many generations of our human life before we've completely changed ecosystems from these invasive species introductions. Uh, we do have a responsibility and need to take continued action to try and protect these water bodies. They're here because of humans, we do have a responsibility. And again, everyone I think can play a role in helping to protect them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colette. Um, it's always a frightening subject to hear about the invasives that are here and the ones that could come. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fran G. Quinto. Fran is a plant ecologist who specializes in invasive species and the negative effects they can have on the surrounding natural environment. She focuses on developing evidence-based solutions to environmental problems, particularly for the restoration of damaged habitats and the protection of biodiversity. And today, Fran's going to be talking about a project which is very close to my heart, and that's the control of giant hogweed on the River Luba in County Limerick. So over to you, Fran. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome, everyone. And thanks very much to the organisers and the speakers so far. Um, found it a very stimulating um, morning. So thank you. So I'm just going to give a snapshot of the results of um, the first 20, 21 months, really, it's a two, first two years of a three year project, 21 months out of 28 months of giant hogweed control on the River Luba. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of context, back in 2014, um, Limerick City and County Council and Ballyhara Development, um, both in County Limerick, they, they recognised giant hogweed problem in the town of Kilmallock, one of the main towns in the area, a public safety issue, and they implemented a programme of chemical control. And um, it was successful, I'll, I'll talk about that later, um, but by um, 2018 they recognised that unless um, that the infestations upstream were controlled, um, that Kilmallock could always be recolonised because the main form of dispersal for giant hogweed is by seed, which is dispersing downstream. So in 2019, um, Limerick City and County Council got Heritage Council funding um, for, to develop a survey and then devise a control strategy. And then later on that year, under Department of Culture, Heritage and Gale took funding under the National Biodiversity Action Plan, there was um, implemented a three year programme to implement that strategy. So first of all, the survey, well, Limerick City and County Council contacted landowners to obtain permission. Um, we had permission from all landowners along the river. It's 27, about 27 kilometres of river, um, 54 kilometres of riverbank. Um, and we did the survey by walkover. It took six days. We didn't restrict it to the river corridor, which we estimated between sort of 15, 20 metres out from either bank. Um, we followed all the tributaries down and we followed it from its source. And we went through um, various landowners um, fields just to make sure there was no hogweed further out um, out of the corridor. Um, this is a sort of an overall picture of the survey, um, the findings, so not too bad in the in the upper catchment, here it is, these are the, the two tributaries coming um, forming the river, the river Luba, and then it starts to get dense um, down into Kilmallock and then the effects of the control program um, begin to show. This was the chemical control program. Um, and so it gets that the infestations get lighter and lighter. And then it starts to build up at the point where um, the Luba joins the, the Meg. Um, and that's partly because of um, the nature of the river and partly because landowners in that area are older um, and may not get to control it themselves. So um, the benefits of our walkover approach, you know, the sort of modern idea would be to use drone technology. Um, we may not have got permission to use drones over part of the land and it, it did allow us, it was, it was slow, but it allowed us to take a sort of good observation of the habitats and there's some interesting fossil classified habitats down there to identify the river related issues affecting giant hog dispersal. We could map access to the river and often access was quite challenging. Um, so we found the points at which we could get to it easily and it also gave us an opportunity to informally meet landowners and local residents on our way. <laughs> 
Um, and then the strategy, well, um, it has to be systematic. All invasive species work has to be systematic. We had to start in the upper reaches at the source. And then we worked within sections. We divided the river into sections, largely based on accessibility. And access was made difficult by electric fences, hedges, ditches, and cows. Where they, they, those were the main, the main difficulties, and often having to walk long distances. Um, we uh, decided on a manual approach with no use of herbicide in the river corridor and it's absolutely necessary and I'll discuss this later. We used a combination of cutting the flowering heads and then digging out plants. Um, a key part of it was to prevent secondary invaders. We knew there was Japanese knotweed in the upper catchment and we knew that we had to control this otherwise this would be spreading downstream. Um, one of the most interesting and important aspects of the work, I, I think, is, is actually then monitoring recolonization by native species after dig out. Um, we invited landowners to give access and provide as assistance for specific projects, um, but we didn't ask them specifically for money or any specific resources. And then finally, as big um, community engagement piece and encouraging use of, of the LCC's Invasive Species app. Why adopt a manual approach? Um, here's um, my colleague cutting out a, a giant hogweed flowering head and this is a, um, this is a large plant where the, the leaves are cut away first before, before attempting to dig out. Um, so why use a manual approach? Well I think what really clinched it for me was a paper back in 2019 by Hanley and Roberts on the economic benefits of invasive species management and they showed really unequivocally that if you're going to control invasive species the cost benefits of that are only exist if your methods don't damage biodiversity or the quality of ecosystem services. Otherwise, essentially, it's a waste of time. So, <clears throat> and we do know that herbicide um, does damage biodiversity and it does damage the quality of ecosystem services, particularly water quality. Our second reason was that Limerick City and County Council have signed up to the All Island Pollinator Plan and the project is funded by the National Biodiversity Action Plan and both of these encourage reduced herbicide use. And then the third one really was our, our hypothesis is that recolonization of the riparian margin with native species back to the native flora, the riverbank flora, is going to occur more quickly without the use of herbicide and to have a, a good intact revegetated riverbank habitat is going to be the best protection from further invasions. So Based on that, um, we need to balance, um, we have a small budget and we need to balance between being effective in our control methods and protecting biodiversity. So we regarded the river corridor as about 20 meters out from river bank, the river bank on both sides, but we dug out to 150 meters, 200 meters as required. So we didn't really keep to that river corridor for the dig out, um, but there were five infestations outside of the corridor. These were private properties in Kilmallock and elsewhere, where we treated with herbicide because we didn't have the budget, we didn't have the time or the labour to actually go and dig those areas out and they were well outside the, our corridor. So here's where we're digging out giant hogweed when it's dispersing from the rivers into the pastures and some of these pastures are very interesting, um, you know we don't want to be using herbicide in them, here are the giant hogweed plants. Um, here this is well up beyond 200 meters from the corridor in a private estate and we dug it out, here you can see the mature um, the, the dead stems of the giant hogweed and we dug these out as well um, and this is back in January 2020 you can see the extent of growth. In, in contrast, a an example of a chemically treated area, one of the five areas, um, this was, um, this is, this isn't actually the right picture, I couldn't find it, but it's very similar to what the infestation looked like, and it was well beyond out of the river corridor, and we, rural social scheme workers came in, and we were training them to, to help us, and so we used this area for, their, for them to train and dig out, this is what it looked like after the dig out, but in fact that combination of claggy wet soil extremely difficult to get the roots out and inexperience it led to regrowth and so we eventually treated this particular area. So that was really how we defined um, when to use herbicide and when not to.
but we didn't use it at all in the river corridor except for one Japanese knotweed infestation. So our schedule 2019 the project didn't start until July so we really were a bit late for cutting the flowering heads um, but we did um, get through the whole catchment and we bagged and disposed about 900 kilos of seeds. We certainly didn't get them all um, and this viability is for two to three years so you can see down that we're going to be seeing those seeds left then in 2021 and 2022. In 2020, the mild winter meant that there was growth in January and we flew through. We started in January and ended October and we dug out the, the entire um, period. We dug out at least 35,000 plants, thousands of seedlings, and we dug out also all the pre-flowering heads. So here, and so by August, July, August, there were no flowering heads to cut out. So we know that as far as, as we can tell, we had no seed drop in 2020. And then in 2021, well, there are no plants to dig out so far, but we're now starting um, just going down, walking through the whole catchment again, digging out where we're finding it. So just I can't go into detail about the methods here, but just a few key points. We are producing some training videos and they'll be available um, for free. There's, I mean, it's not rocket science. There's nothing um, magnificently special about digging out giant hogweed, but a few tips and tricks um, that we've discovered over the last couple of years. So firstly, in the literature, it always talks about giant hogweed having a tap root. Well, we've rarely found this. This we found with OPW down in Adair. Um, they asked us to go and look at a particular site, but most commonly, these are what the roots look like and they're, they're huge, they're substantial and there's no single tap root but you can see from these red arrows these are significant roots and they will regrow if they're left in the ground. These kind of more adventitious roots here, these smaller ones, these are okay, they can be left in the ground and they won't regrow. When you dig out the plant, you can, there's this kind of, some of the, the sort of the bulk of them can be huge. Um, this one was we dug out in February, it had a hard frost on it, it was we left it on the ground and hey presto when we bent back you can just see that it's beginning to grow. So you need to when you dig out the roots you need to chop them up. Um, regrowth from roots versus germination. I'm just showing this because it can be difficult to identify um, them when they're very young. This is where you're getting regrowth from roots and you can see it's looking pretty much like a typical giant hogweed leaf, all those serrations. These are the seedlings. Um, and really for the unexperienced eye, you can easily pass them over as being a kind of native species and not giant hogweed at all. Uh, seeds also we've seen that they're germinating at all times of the year. Now these pre-flowering heads, here's a pre-flowering head, now the stem and the leaves, there's enough nutrients on those for this flowering, this, this cut flowering head to go on and produce seed. So when you cut them back, you can leave them on the ground but you must chop them up and that actually breaks up those, those nutrient reserves and stop them from going on to produce seed. Then, I mean, the other, the other point, and we're seeing this all the time, is that variable flowering times, we're seeing flowering in January, we're, we're seeing flowering in September. So don't just assume that you're only going to get those flowering heads and those seeds produced um, just in July, June and July and August, which is, you know, what it says in the literature. It's not the case any longer. Biosecurity absolutely critical because we're working along a whole river length and we do have crayfish um, in some parts of the river. We were using Vercon um, and but we found it to be terrifically expensive and also it's it's toxic to aquatic invertebrates so we've we've gone to using Milton's um, but we are very um, stringent in, in our biosecurity and cleaning our equipment and boots um, between sites. Um, then the other, the second, well, you see the other primary invaders really in, in the catchment, well, there's Japanese knotweed. This is in one of the upper tributaries, one of the sources of the, of, of the luba. Um, it's a big infestation and we treated this with stem injection with glyphosate. It's really the most effective method for, for Japanese knotweed, especially in an infestation like this, where we, because we were getting the basal crowns beginning to float down the river. Um, there were four other infestations we found, but not within the corridor, and we treated all those with stem injection and um, glyphosate. Here's another little infestation by a bridge on the Luba. Uh, 
um, where we're happy that we've got Japanese knotweed under control. And so finally, just looking at recolonization with native species after dig out. Now, we'll be able to tell you a lot more by the end of this year. This is really one of the, 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 the main, our main areas of focus this year. But here's an example. This was giant hogweed was, di um, was dug out from an area in the mid catchment. And then six months later, five, six months later, you're seeing lesser celandine and um, widely colonized, just really taken over. And you wouldn't know that giant hogweed um, had been there. Now, um, my colleague Nick, he, Nick Head, he's, he's, he's working with herbicide and he's working with manual dig out all the time. And he's saying that the recolonization after dig out is much faster and there's more diversity compared with herbicide treatment, but we don't have any kind of unequivocal data to, to show you yet. Um, native hogweed um, and cow parsley, um, which is also kind of quite closely related to, to hogweed, they're, they're the pioneers, they come in, they have this incredible recolonization ability and they just come in very rapidly when, when giant hogweed is dug out. And native hogweed in, in, in particular, it's, a, it's um, a hugely important pollinator species. There's been a recent study which has shown that 600 species of insects will, will come to feed on a, an, on a single native hogweed plant in one season. That's a phenomenal number. Um, and so please, if you're involved in, in hogweed control, make sure that you know how to distinguish between native hogweed and giant hogweed and there are some 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 keys to tips to how to to make that distinction on the Limerick City and County Council website. Um, shade and closed canopies are, are clearly going to make it more difficult for native species to recolonize. Um, and then finally, um, what's our biggest challenge from the river? You, you know, it looks as if the project is being successful in terms of in terms of um, uh, of um, controlling the giant hogweed, we think we can eradicate the giant hogweed from the whole catchment, from the whole corridor, and we think we've got all the sources of hogweed um, in the sort of the, 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 the narrow catchment of the area. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, what to do when recolonizing native species um, becomes seriously invasive. And here we are, we have Butterbur. This is a native species, Butterbur petasites hybridus. Um, this is an area where we dug out giant hogweed. It's a sandy bank in the mid reaches. Um, there was a little bit of, of the Butterbur um, growing here at the back. And kind of four or five months later, we came back and the whole area had been completely colonized by the Butterbur. Um, here it is, it's got these huge leaves. Um, you know, we have, um, we, thanks to the University of Stirling, um, we've been able to um, make sure that this is not the giant, I thought it was giant butterbur at first because of its size. It's not, the, the difference between them is very small. Um, we also have the white butterbur, which is up in Scotland, which is an invasive alien, which is threatening Ireland. And we also have um, the giant, hog, the giant um, butterbur, which is already in Ireland. But this is the native butterbur. And then finally, just to show you just how invasive it is, um, is here it is growing along the side of the road, very closely related to winter heliotrope, which is causing havoc in our road verges. And the big question, I'd be very interested to have people's opinions here, is what do we do about this because it's a native species? Do we leave it? Um, but where, where are the constraints that would normally control a native species um, in Ireland? So I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I'll hand back over to Anne. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francis, for that very comprehensive overview of the project. Um, our next speaker is Brian Nelson, and Brian is the invertebrate ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service with responsibility for white clawed crayfish. He is interested in biogeography and conservation of all Irish invertebrates with a special interest in freshwater and wetland species. And Brian is going to talk to us about biosecurity and conservation of our native crayfish species. Over to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen here. Uh, bear with me. Does that, uh, is that visible to people? Yes, perfect, Brian. Okay, hopefully I'll be able to change my slides because um, I'm not actually, uh, yeah, okay. 
Right. Uh, th thank you very much for the introduction. And it's been a really interesting conference, and I'm conscious I'm the last speaker and try and uh, not keep people away from lunch. It is a long time to sit through these. So yeah, as as Anne said, I, I'm the invertebrate ecologist, and one of the species I have responsibility is the white-tailed crayfish. Um, we've had a very good introduction by Colette on invasive species, and apologies if I repeat some of the things that um, Colette says, and, and also uh, Fran's last talk as well, which was uh, dealing with single species. Uh, but hopefully it, it will um, it will be important in the context of what we're talking about. So uh, is this... Uh, no, I'm not sure how I get the slide to go on here. Um, Brian, just do an escape out yeah. of it and Is go that back. Changed? Can no. you hear me? Sorry? It hasn't changed, Brian. Just if you uh, escape, do press escape and go back in again and then stop screen share. Yeah, for some, for some reason it's gone on to me, second screen for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, I'll share a screen again. Um, let's make sure that's off. Right, is that visible now? Yes, yeah. Why is it not going to slide? Is that, that's the slideshow now. Is that is that visible in the slideshow? Yes, that's fine, Brian. That's perfect. Yeah. And it's changed? Yes. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you an explanation of crayfish in Ireland, uh, the first part of the talk. So what we're talking about is a single species. Ireland has one species of crayfish. Now, crayfish are distinguished into two groups, and the reason for this will come clear maybe a bit later on. There are what are called indigenous crayfish species, and then there are species which are non-indigenous crayfish species. And the, the reason for this distinction rather than having say native and non-native is that people have been moving crayfish around for centuries and if we go back to pre-1500 which is usually taken as the cutoff point for native and non-native species uh we did not we did we did not have white-tailed crayfish quite cough crayfish were just definitely introduced by people we know that from the genetics uh, but because they were introduced um before about 1500, they probably naturally spread slowly through the landscape. Okay, they were in, in non-native species, but the, their impact was not in the um, way that Colette was describing. The um, species adapted slowly to its new environment and the Irish freshwater system coped with that, that's, that um, introduction. So, This is a map here, shows the distribution of the white tail crayfish, the map on the left, and the brown shading uh, indicates the regions where that the species is considered native. It is, a, it is a, however, a species complex, and the Italian population is now considered to be perhaps a different species. Uh, and then in Britain, Ireland, and Spain, the populations there are derived from old introductions, and the species has spread throughout that. The map on the right then shows the distribution in Ireland. It may not be very visible, but everywhere there's a black dot is a positive crayfish record. And you can see crayfish occur throughout most of the central part of Ireland on the limestone. There is a requirement for crayfish to have high degree of limestone, lime in the uh, calcium in the, in the water. So they do not tend, they do not occur in very acid areas. So they're absent completely from Kerry, most of Cork, um, very noticeably in Wexford, um, and on the west coast, Connemara, West Mayo, and most of Donegal. The Donegal populations are restricted to the limestone areas of South Donegal. Um, what I've also tried to show is that the, the distribution then extends into Northern Ireland, mostly in Fermanagh, uh, but also in some of the rivers up the west coast side of Loch Ney. Um, and that is the range of the crayfish and it probably it probably um occupies most of the range of the species that 
that would be um, usual for the species in expected for the species in Ireland. What sort of habitats do crayfish, um, white tailed crayfish, occur in? Well, white, white tailed crayfish is in Europe, where it occurs with other species, is generally a species of small streams. So it's generally a species of headwater streams. Does not occur in large uh, rivers or generally in open waters because other species there are, are there to um, take those niches. But in Ireland, and again, this is this is something that um, Colette will have mentioned. In whenever a species comes into a new environment, it often occupies a, a wider range of habitats, and that's certainly the case of white claw crayfish in Ireland. And um, so we get this the River Shore at uh, Kilsheelan Bridge, um, where crayfish were very abundant before the plague came. Um, quite a wide wide stretch of river, Lowland River again is. In Europe, is probably not a habitat you would expect to see white tailed crayfish, but in Ireland they do very well there. And the use, more usual habitat for for white tailed crayfish is this. The, these are this is a small um, set, section of the Brisky River in County Cavan, quite a stony bed, um, fairly fast flowing, um, calcium rich habitat, and that's again an abundant uh, population of white tailed crayfish were present there. But perhaps the biggest um, change of white tailed crayfish in Ireland compared to other parts of the world, other parts of its range, are, is its occurrence in lakes. And we probably don't know every lake population, almost certainly our lake population we just do not know about. Uh, even, even though we have, it is a protected species, we don't have that many records. But th this is a small lake in County Donegal, Loch Nageeg, which is uh, declared a special area of scientific, in, uh, special area conservation for the species. Um, it occurs in fairly typical South Donegal um, landscape. doesn't look particularly um, calcium rich, but the, obviously the water that feeds the lake is, is sufficient for the crayfish to build their shells. And there's quite a good population in, the, in this lake. But lake populations um, certainly would be unusual. And, and when we get lakes the size of Loch Uwell that have crayfish, that certainly is something that is probably unique to Ireland. So, moving on to what the threats to crayfish populations are. And there are two, two threats, but they all stem from, from one thing, and they all stem from what I, I was saying about the non-Indigenous crayfish species. Uh, in the, in globally, crayfish, most of the crayfish species in the world occur in North America. North America has several hundred species of native crayfish species. Uh, Australia has a significant number. Uh, Europe has five species of native crayfish. Um, but for, for reasons to do with um, the losses of crayfish, crayfish are a very important uh, cultural food in, in, in many parts of Europe. And that, that's why they were introduced to Ireland. They were probably introduced uh, in connection with monasteries. They kept fish ponds and they had crayfish as a source of food. The European crayfish are rather small. They also were, were mysteriously dying out. And, that, and that's part of the story we'll come to in a minute. Mysteriously dying out. So people decided, oh, we'll bring in some of these big American crayfish because they're easier to grow. They live in ponds and they've got more meat on them. And that really is the is what signaled the death now for European crayfish. Um, so agriculture and that, that carried on it still carries on to some extent these days. Uh, people were introducing non native crayfish way outside the range. Increasingly now, you're seeing a trade in aquarium species. A lot of these species coming from Australia. They're very attractive. They are generally warm water species, but they will escape and become established in other areas. Uh, why people want to keep pets is obviously up to them, but it's whenever they deliberately release those or they escape into the wild that causes the problem. But the big problem with um, the introduction of the American crayfish is unknowingly they brought over a disease. The North American crayfish have a external parasite called crayfish plague, which is a, a group of organisms. It's, it's actually called a water mold. It is related to 
Sorry, Brian, we've lost you. We can't hear you. Brian, we, we can't hear you. Brian? Brian, can you unmute? Brian, we can't hear you. Sorry, every so often my, my system seems to mute me. I apologize for that. Uh, did, did you miss much of the talk? Uh, about a minute. Hello? Hello, Brian. Can you hear me? We missed about a minute, I'd say. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, can, can I still be heard? Yeah. Yeah, Brian, we can hear you. We can hear you, Brian. Uh, when, whenever um, North American crayfish were brought over to, to Europe, um, they inadvertently brought this disease uh, called crayfish plague. And once I got into the European population, this map shows how it has spread through the European continent, where clearly rivers are um, connected with each other, but also by movement of people. So crayfish were moved into Scandinavia. They were um, used widely in fish farms and other parts of the world, brought into Spain. Um, this circular movement, and then eventually they jumped across to Britain. So 1981, uh, the first crayfish plague was seen in Britain. In 1986, they were brought across to um, Ireland. Uh, and this movement is associated with the, with the aquaculture trade. The signal crayfish were promoted widely in the 70s and 80s as a way of farming fish, food production. The plague was brought with them. Um, and this has decimated the European crayfish populations. So crayfish plague in Ireland. Uh, there was an outbreak of crayfish plague in the 70s and 80s. Now this was before um, DNA and a lot of genetic revolutions. Uh, and we don't really know what happened to that crayfish plague outbreak. It apparently seemed to die out. Um, but in 2015, a new uh, crayfish outbreak was, was found. And this was on the River Brusky in County Cavan, a rather small stream. Um, we don't really know why it occurred there, where it came from, or how it started. But it very rapidly, it was, fortunately it was detected. Whenever I, I, I mentioned about animals being found, there's a very short window when you can see the crayfish dead on the riverbed. Uh, they either get covered with sediment or the natural flow of the river moves the bodies. And as the kill zone moves up a river, unless you happen to be there in a, in a 10 day period, you probably would not notice dead crayfish. They disappear, they get covered up. And of course, you won't see crayfish. If there are no crayfish there and you don't see them, you don't know they're absent unless you're looking for them. So this was a common site on the on the River Brisky in County Cavan. And then we in 2017, we had the outbreaks on the Shore, the Barrow, the Noor, the Deal, uh, the Meg, then the year after. We've had a we've had outbreaks on the River Laura on the north end of Loch Derg, uh, Loch Ree, sorry, and then Loch Derg, sorry, and then on the uh, Al River on the southern end of Loch Derg. Now the, the Clare River, which is marked in red, which is over by the, by Corrib, that is a detection of 
crayfish plague by eDNA and not and this is the brusky up here. We also have an eDNA one up here which is not marked. Um, so that that is the current position. The yellow the yellow um, catchments are the ones that are not affected by crayfish plague. So we have had reports of deaths on, for example, the Liffey, two or three reports of deaths. Fortunately, they've all been negative. Uh, the Boyne is the catchment that was affected by the early one. And there are still crayfish in some of these, some of the rivers, but we we haven't really got a very good handle on the Boyne. The D is still occupied and the, these ones here. The River Blackwater, which is a cross-border one, is affected in Northern Ireland, somewhere up here. But we don't have a, we don't have that impact in the Republic yet. The crayfish bag obviously generated a lot of publicity at the time, um, and a lot of action was taken then with signage to try and get the message across. So we come to the real probably the nub of this talk is how how can we conserve Irish crayfish? Well, we ha we have legislation in. Uh, in place that does uh, allow us to do do that. So, the Wildlife Act uh, in 1976 has been amended, so crayfish are protected by that. The Wildlife Act also makes it um, amended has also been make it illegal to introduce any non-native species. But part part of the one of the downsides of being the EU is that um, trade um, swamps everything and. That is proving very. That was proving very difficult to control. You cannot control the import of species uh, from the rest of the EU because that's a trade issue. Um, and it's only recently that the EU has woken up to the problem of invasive species, as Claire, as Colette mentioned. And we now have a regulation that allows us to regulate the trade of a listed group of species, and that includes many crayfish. Uh, there are also other bits of legislation that affect uh, crayfish, and one is the OIE Animal Health Regulations, which controls the um, crayfish plague. It is a disease under that, and that under, comes under the auspices of the Marine Institute. If we look at the Habitats Directive, these are the three assessments of crayfish over the periods of the Habitats Directive. We have to report every six years on that. And the last assessment in 2019 is that crayfish is in a bad state and it's getting worse and that reflects the impact of crayfish plague on the population. Uh, again as Colette said we have to get biosecurity in so we have to recognize the crayfish plague is only spread by people. There may be natural ways to spread we don't understand but essentially it is it is big people and we know that from the Irish outbreaks because at least three of them involved different genotypes of the plague. They can only have come in from people and the spread, it was not spread within Ireland. So the, the Brusky outbreak did not spread to the shore. That They are actually different genotypes. And there are other outbreaks that are not related to the Brusky one as well. So they must have been independent events and they must have come in by people. And the message, and what I would say is we, we are living in a pandemic. The reason that we are all online is that we are not being allowed to spread disease, uh, the COVID disease between each other. So we have now gone into lockdown to stop that. And that really is the only way that we can stop crayfish plague. Everybody has to adopt a very strict biosecurity. All your equipment must be clean. If you're going to a new river, you must go in clean. When you come out of the river, you must clean before you go anywhere else because river water does not, river water can contain the plague organism. It does not naturally spread from a river in County Donegal to a river in County Cork. And biosecurity has to come to the normal state. And again, this is a message that we are being um, told about in uh, in the COVID. Uh, and just, just to go on the point about uh, natural movement and its humans, 
organisms that come in to Ireland from New Zealand does not happen naturally. Water does not move across the Atlantic Ocean naturally. Yet that is what happened whenever we brought crayfish plague across to Europe from uh, North America. And I'm just going to my last slide. So, so, so what, what, and this talk, is, this uh, conference has been very useful because um, uh, it's certainly been mentioned earlier. What, what, what are we aiming for in our rivers? If we are aiming for naturally functioning wild rivers, we must never have non-native crayfish species. If, if we get a, an established population of non-native crayfish species, which carry the crayfish plague and are immune to it, then we will never get uh, back to a state where white tailed crayfish is secure in Ireland. So we must never have, we must have crayfish. We have crayfish plague, but we have no non-native species. So we still have a bit of hope in Ireland, but we have to still have strict biosecurity and everything. And this does not apply just to crayfish plague. This is, applies to everything. There must be no transfer of water without biosecurity. We maybe have to ban high risk activities from certain rivers. Do, do people really need to go wild swimming in upland lakes? That's a question that I'm posing. Uh, and then we have the aims of the habitat directive and the water framework that directive of good native, good ecological condition and the crayfish maintained its native range. If we want to come to that state again, we have to have no crayfish plague. We absolutely have to have no nicks ever. And we're not just talking about, you know, in 10 years time, this is, you know, forever. Uh, activities have to be allowed, but there has to be permanent and strict biosecurity. Or do we want a situation where we just have crayfish retained in a few arc sites? Well, again, we must never have nicks in Ireland because crayfish arcs will break down unless we have constant vigilance. We must have strict permanent biosecurity around those arc sites, and we must have sites that have banning all human activities, all risk activities. So thank you, that's my last slide. And hopefully I'll be able to stop sharing at this point. Thanks very much for that very sobering talk, Brian, on the future of our league. Um, there, could I ask our three panelists from that session to maybe turn on your cameras again, please? Um, we've quite a few questions for you. Mark, do you want to take some of the questions? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much for those really interesting talks. Um, so yeah, there's a number of questions, some general ones and some specifically for you. Uh,